All right, praise the Lord, everyone. Welcome to Wednesday night Bible study. We have gone through uh, the book of James, and we have also gone through the book of 1 Peter. So tonight we are beginning 2 Peter, chapter 1. There's three chapters in 2 Peter, so um, this should go pretty good, I think. And then we will uh, probably go into a couple of these other pastoral letters near the end of the New Testament. So when we talked about 1 Peter and his theme in that letter, and of course we remember that these letters circulated throughout the churches. So there's times when um, in the Bible, in the New Testament, they'll say, make sure you read the letter from so-and-so and send that. To. They circulated these letters that the apostles and the elders wrote to the church um, even though it was maybe written to the church in Rome or to the church in Galatia, it was for all the churches. And he talked about in his first letter the correct response as maturing Christians that we should have when it comes to suffering. And none of us like to suffer, right? But he talked about how the suffering wasn't necessarily suffering from natural things, but it was more suffering due to affliction from the world as far as pertaining to being a Christian. So in 2 Peter, as he begins to anticipate the end of his life, he leaves a reminder of a few different things. One, he reminds us that the gospel, the word of God, is authentic. And he warns us about false teachers. And then he instructs us to avoid deception through just having that assurance in the authority of the word of God, right? God's word is sovereign. It is unchanging. The Bible says it's forever settled in heaven. So we need to make sure that we have God's word hid in our heart, as David said, that we might not sin against him. So 2 Peter, and I'm going to read through verses 1 and 2, and then we're going to talk about those two verses as we kind of, we've been doing it that way. So it says, Simon Peter, he introduces himself, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So he introduces himself and then he describes his role, right? What does he identify himself as first? A servant, a servant, right? He is a servant first and an apostle. And a lot of times we think of an apostle, that's a, in a pretty important role. It's a pretty important calling, title, however you want to look at it when you look at the apostles of Jesus Christ. But he identified himself as a servant first. And I really believe that it's because, much like the rest of the apostles, he learned on that day at the Last Supper when they got done eating and Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me. And they started asking about who it is. And it went from the conversation, if you remember, went from who's going to betray him to who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So it went from not even, you know, really concerned about Jesus being betrayed, but it went to, well, it's not going to be me. And then because, you know, it says, well, it's not going to be me, Dallas. So Obviously, it, it would be you before it would be me, or, and, and Dallas might turn to Derek and say, well, it would be Derek before it would be me, and kind of, and then it went to a conversation on who's the greatest. So while they're having this debate around the table, Jesus stands up while they're talking. This is how I kind of envision it in my mind. He gets his howl. He ties it around his waist, or he puts it through his, his uh, waistband there, and he gets some water, and he begins to wash their feet and to dry their feet because he's sending the example of servanthood. And, of course, Peter was the one that, when he got to Peter, he says, what? You're not going to wash my feet, right? right? Peter says, no way. And so what did Jesus say? If I, don't, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part of me. And so now he identifies himself. He learned from that as a servant and an apostle. So... Now he's reaching out to them that have obtained this like precious faith. So they have that same experience, right? 
of salvation through the gospel of Jesus Christ, who have that like precious faith with us through, it says, the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. So we know that our faith comes through having that relationship with God, being right with God, and having that relationship with Jesus and experiencing salvation. So he's saying, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. This is what we have experienced. This is how we've experienced it. So now he's blessing them, saying, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God. And that word knowledge means recognition or full discernment. That talks about a level of maturity. Because when we first come to God, we don't have a knowledge of God, right? But we learn and we grow in him. So he's talking about maturity. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God. So that grace and peace, he's referring to God's unmerited favor. He's referring to power through which God enables those of faith to do what pleases him. And he's encouraging that, saying it's going to be multiplied as we have knowledge or that recognition, that full discernment of God. So that tells me that where's the limit on that grace and peace? There is no limit, right? Because when are we going to ever come to a complete understanding of who God is? Probably never. The Bible says as the heavens are higher than the earth, his ways are higher than our ways. And so... He says, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Interestingly, in chapter 3 and verse 18, which is the last verse of the second letter, it closes with the Lord encouraging us to grow in grace. So verse 3, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and and godliness, so our life is twofold. We have our natural side, and we have our spiritual side. But again, that divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, again, through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. Whereby, verse 4 says, are given unto us. So through that knowledge of him, and through that divine power, he says, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these precious promises we might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So let's look at these two verses here. Again, so he's saying that according to God's divine nature, it's given us all things that pertain to our natural life and our spiritual needs, right? And that comes through the knowledge of God, that's called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these, referring to the precious promises, we can be partakers of that divine nature, escaping the corruption that's in the world through lust. So that word virtue, it means, um, and this, this isn't to be, exclude any gender, but it means manliness or valor. It means excellence. So virtue has an intentionality behind it. It's not something that's bestowed upon us. It's something that's sought after, right? It's valor. It's excellence, having that virtue in Jesus Christ, wanting to give our very best for him. And that divine nature, the word nature means growth or germination. So as that's in us, the nature of God, it should grow escaping the corruption or the decay that's in the world and not just speaking of the planet we live on but that system of the world that orderly arrangement is what it means so we can escape that as we are divine uh, as we are partakers of that divine nature it doesn't mean that we become divine because we're still in this flesh right so even though we've had the Holy Ghost, even though we've been born again and have a relationship with God, we still struggle, right? We're still in this flesh. We still have challenges. So it doesn't mean we become divine, but it means that we can express the effect of the promises we've received. So when God puts his spirit in us, 
and we receive those, we can, we can express, we can display the effect of what God is doing in our life. I think there's a verse that says, um, it talks about glorifying God, that we could show forth the praises of him who's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And that escape, escaping the corruption that's in the world through lust, that took place when we received the promise of the Holy Ghost. So we have to allow his spirit to continue to work in us, providing daily what we need to remain safe. So that's what Peter's telling us. He's saying God has given us these great and precious promises. They've come through that relationship with him and that knowledge of him, and it's drawing us together in one mind and one accord, and that divine power has given us all things, and through that knowledge he's calling us to great and exceeding precious promises so that we can display what God's doing in our life. So as we come together as a church, people who have been bought, bought by the blood of Jesus Christ and experiencing the power of salvation in our life, we should be displaying that more and more every day in our life. And so he talks about that. So it's, it's talking about we obtain the like precious faith, that our born-again nature and that experience with Jesus Christ and knowing him and his righteousness and things being multiplied, that it will bring us to a point where we can display what God can do in somebody's life. And then verses 5 through 7, he, he shifts the gear and he kind of takes it up a notch. He says, and beside this, so beside everything he's already said, a, right along with that, partnering together with everything he's already said, this uh, precious faith, the righteousness and knowledge of God, his divine power and that glory and virtue and all of these things, partnering along with that, he says, giving all diligence, and that means speed or eagerness. He says, add or furnish besides, fully supply to your faith virtue. And again, that word virtue means that valor, that excellence. So add to your faith excellence. And then to that excellence, he says, um, he says to add knowledge. And that's the act of knowing. And to knowledge, add temperance or self-control. To temperance, add patience. We had a conversation about this uh, not too long ago. Um, talking about people praying for patience, right? Mm -hmm. We should pray for wisdom, <laughs> right? Because patience is, means trials, right? But he's saying, add to your knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, to that um, self-control, add patience. And that word patience means cheerful endurance. Sometimes we think of patience as just putting up with it, right? You ever been patient with somebody and had a bad attitude through the whole thing? Been upset about it, but I'm being patient with them. Well, not really, because it means cheerful endurance, and that's tough. And then adding to your patience, godliness. So it, in all of these, it's, it's partnering along with them. Add, that word add means to... Um, fully supply it means to bring it together and to that patience godliness or holiness and to godliness brotherly kindness which is fraternal affection as brothers and sisters in christ and to brotherly kindness charity and that's love or the agape love so it's encouraging us to bear fruit that resulted from participating in the divine nature so everything he said before, beside this, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge temperance, to temperance patience, to patience godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness charity or love. So these verses 5 through 7, they point out that these character traits do not exist apart from each other but each is united into the other. They're working together. It's not saying, well, 
I, I can take, you know, I'll add knowledge and, and maybe temperance, but I'm, I'm not going to do the others. It doesn't work that way. He's saying that they unite together, they work together, and this is why. In verse 8, it says, For if these things be in you and abound, they make you, that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it says, for if these things be in you, but interestingly, again, we've talked about this before. Sometimes um, in translation, they add words for better understanding, but the word if does not appear in the original text. So it could really be translated, for these things being in you and abounding, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful. So if we've come to this point, is what he's saying, we need to add these things into our life, giving all diligence, adding these things into our life. Because if they're in our life, we won't be barren or unfruitful. So what he's saying is that Jesus wants for us to continue in our relationship with him. Right? It's not his will that we just come to a certain point and stop. Or that we just uh, become... Uh, you know, just, uh, he wants us to participate. He doesn't want us just to be in the audience, right? He wants us to get involved in his kingdom. So if we have those things, we're going to be fruitful. We're not going to be barren. We're going to develop in that knowledge of Jesus Christ, that knowing him of who he is. But verse 19, or I'm sorry, verse 9 rather, says, But he that lacketh these things, first off is blind, and secondly, he cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. That word purged means a washing off. So what he's saying is you were washed off, you were cleansed from your former life, from your former sins, right? That happened when we were born again. But if we lack faith and virtue and knowledge and temperance and patience and godliness and brotherly kindness and charity if we lack those things we're blind and cannot see afar off and we've forgotten that we were purged from that old lifestyle what he's talking about here is that we are it's talking about having uh, like willingly shutting our eyes and deliberately choosing to forget where we came from there's a verse in the Bible that talks about uh, being willingly ignorant about things. That, you know, to put it bluntly, that means we're being dumb on purpose, right? He's talking about willingly shutting our eyes, turning our back, knowing what we're doing, having a knowledge of it, and still turning away from God. It's a deliberate choice. So, wherefore, he says in verse 10, the rather... Or more so, brethren, give diligence to make your calling, that invitation from Jesus, and your election, how he selected us. Make it sure. For if you do these things, listen to this promise, you shall never fall. That's never is an absolute. Right? Never, always. I always try to be careful not to use absolutes when I talk with people or you know like oh you'll never you'll never do that you know i i don't know that they will never do that but that always happens i don't know that I, I haven't been there when it's always happened you know but we use those absolutes god in his word used an absolute that if we do these things in verses five through seven adding to our faith he says we won't be barren or unfruitful and we will never fall and that word fall means trip Never trip. Why do we trip? Sharon and I went for a walk the other day around the block, and there's a lot of sidewalk sections that are heaved up due to roots and things from trees. And we were on the south side, and there was not any light there. And she caught her toe on one, and she she didn't fall, but she tripped. And that's happened. I mean, it happened to both of us several times because of the unevenness in the sidewalk. 
it happens because we don't see. We can't see where we're walking, right? And something's in our way. Yeah, pitfalls. The enemy likes to do that. The world likes to do that. Our own flesh likes to do that. So this is talking about having really that power in our life to avoid those pitfalls, like Brother John called them, from the enemy or from this world or from even our own flesh. If we're continually adding, continually furnishing and fully supplying in our life these things, and that takes definite intentionality. It takes a desire. It takes a uh, an attitude that says this this is who I'm going to be and this is where I'm going to these are the goals I'm going to set up in my life and what Peter is saying is there's really no other option if we wish to serve the Lord than to diligently apply ourselves there's no other option because he says if you do these things you will never fall so what is that telling us if we don't do them you're going to fall there's no, the only alternative here, and we have to understand this, is to stumble because there's no simply standing in place. We can't just freeze up and say, well, you know, you know, imagine if I'd uh, on that walk around the block, you know, if we saw, well, there's, there's things in the way we're going to trip and we just stood there. Or you could go the bad way. Well, we know that that's not the will. That, that can be worse. And there's just as many pitfalls in your life behind right yeah so the only alternative is stumble there is no standing in place so if we don't want to fall then this is what we need to do god is really clear in his word isn't he he's really very clear to give us everything we need to be successful in him but our hindrance is us it's our flesh So he says, for so, in verse 11, an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're going to enter into the kingdom of God. It's going to be ministered to you. That means it's going to be furnished besides or fully supplied. So in addition to all of the blessings that God wants to do, He says, abundantly, this entrance is going to be given to us to enter into an everlasting kingdom. So it's really telling us the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So that that kingdom belongs to Jesus himself, which would identify him as the one true God, right? Because the structure of that phrase, Lord and Savior, is identical uh, to the, the phrase God and Savior. So it could say, into the everlasting kingdom of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So it belongs to him. Wherefore, he says in verse 12, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things. He says, I'm not going to be negligent. He says, as long as I still have breath in my lungs, I'm going to put you in remembrance of these things. I'm going to remind you, though you know them, and be established in the present truth. That's referring to the new covenant. The present truth is referring to the, the relationship that Jesus has now brought us into. So Peter's saying, and again, he's, he's writing this, as we're going to find out in the next few verses, because he knows, he knows that his, his time on earth is short. He knows that one day he's going to be gone, and the people that he reached and the people that he taught and ministered to and the people he saw come into the kingdom of God He wants them to continue in this. Either it's people he knew or people he knows that will read these words, like us, several thousand years later. So he says, I will not be negligent to you to put you in remembrance of these things. Verse 13, yea, I think it meet or necessary, as long as I'm in this tabernacle, speaking of his flesh, to stir you up, that means to wake you fully, Isn't that ironic? Who was the ones that fell asleep in the garden and who fell asleep in the Mount of Transfiguration? (laughs) It was him and James and John. So he says, as long as I'm in this flesh, I'm going to make sure you're awake by putting you in remembrance. And that's talking about accountability, whether it's spiritually praying for them 
or whether it's reminding them, keeping them accountable. He says, as long as I'm alive, I'm going to keep you in my heart and in my prayers, and I'm going to keep you accountable. Verse 14, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle. Um, Brother John, do you want to get on your Bible there? The Gospel of John, chapter 21. And I'll have you read verses 18 and 19 here in a minute. So John 21 and 18. So Peter is talking to them. He's saying shortly. He would be soon passing to this next life. Even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. And he's referring to John chapter 21, verses 18 and 19. Why don't you read them? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, sanctifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said, Right. So he's talking to Peter and he says, when you were younger, you know, in days past, you went where you wanted. You took your own self there. But there's coming a day when somebody else is going to take you where you would not want to go. And so he's, he, he said signifying of his death. And he says, follow me. And then, of course, Peter turns to him and says, Lord, what about this person? Referring to John. And he says, what is it to you if he tarries until I come? Follow me. So we know that John was the only apostle to die a natural death. All the other apostles were martyred. Um, so Peter knew that Jesus was talking about the days he would, when he would be taken and martyred. So moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able, after my decease, to have these things, to have these things always in remembrance. He says, I'm, I know that I'm going to die. I know that that day is coming. But until that day, I'm going to do my very best to make sure that you remember these things. And I think that he's, you know, God would want that from all of us. We've only got so many days in our life. We've only got so many beats of our heart, so many breath, uh, breaths in our lungs, right? So with those days that we have, because life is a vapor, he wants us to keep people that we love, that we know, that have their experience in Jesus Christ to, to be accountable to them. He wanted them to remember. And then he says in verse 16, for we have not followed cunningly devised fables. He says we're not following something made up. This isn't man-made. This isn't uh, somebody who was smart and put all this together, when we made known unto you the power and coming, or that being near of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his ma majesty. So he's saying that Jesus' is coming is just as real as his departure. The angel said, Ye men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up in the clouds? The same Jesus is coming in the same manner. Verse 17, For he, speaking of Jesus, Received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, and this is the voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the mount. We talked about that a little bit last week. So he's talking about the Mount of Transfiguration when Peter and James and John were there with Jesus and Moses and Elijah showed up. So when he talks about, like when God says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, a lot of times people will, again, separate them, right? Every biblical reference to the Father speaking to the Son or the Son speaking to the Father, it defines the Son in the context of his humanity. So God is the Father of that flesh, but they are still God. And then he says in verse 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, Whereunto you do well that you take heed. So th that phrase that you take heed means to hold the mind or to pay attention, to have it always in our mind, always in our heart. 
as a light shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rises in your heart. He's talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. We have a more sure word of prophecy. Take heed. Jesus is coming back. Right? So the prophecy that they had on the Mount of Transfiguration was that Jesus was going to die because we read, I think it was in Luke, that when the disciples woke up, they heard Moses talking to Jesus about his death, about the crucifixion. So knowing that that was coming, he says we have a more sure word of prophecy knowing that Jesus is coming back for us. And then verses 20 and 21, knowing this first, so having this first and foremost in our mind, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. It's not private explanation or application. It can't be one, one meaning and application for Derek and a different meaning for me. It says, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So again, this affirms the Bible's divine inspiration. And that should be first and foremost in our embracing the truth of God's word. Right? First and foremost, we know that the Bible is the inspired word of God. And God does not lie. And his truth will endure to all generations. Not one small Hebrew mark, it says not one jot or tittle will pass away until Jesus comes back. His word is forever settled in heaven. So that needs to be first and foremost when we embrace the truth of God's word. Knowing that God has given this to us because he loves us and he desires for us to have that relationship with him. So in looking back at all of this, we come to the conclusion that Peter is calling us to spiritual growth to intentional spiritual growth. Everything he built up to, he settles on the foundation of that this is the word of God. This was not devised by man. It wasn't put together by some uh, really smart individual. It doesn't mean one th for one person and something else for another person. It's the word of God. And we need to take this, and as long as we're in this flesh, we need this in our life. Amen? Amen. So next week, we will look at chapter 2. And in chapter 2, he begins to warn of false teachers. And there is a lot of... This sounds accusatory, and it's really not meant to be accusatory. It's just meant to be reality that... If there is one Lord and one faith and one baptism, one God, Father of all, who is above all, through you all, and in you all, like the Bible says, if there's one faith, but yet there are several thousand different Christian denominations or followings that do not all believe the same thing, but yet no scripture is of private interpretation, then that just alludes to the fact that there will be false teachings, whether intentional or unintentional, we're to beware of false teaching and false teachers. Amen. We will see you next Wednesday and hopefully this Sunday.